This is part four of a video series entitled Treasures of Darkness, How to See the Glory of God in Your Darkest Trials. This lesson is entitled String Theories and Spin. String Theories and Spin. Transporters and Replicators. I want you to put on your thinking cap because tonight we're going to take a fascinating journey. As early as the 6th century, Greek philosophers began discussing the possibility that nature was constructed of minuscule, indivisible components they first called atoms. The word atom originally meant indivisible. Scientists eventually began to define all the elements in nature based on their atomic composition, a helium atom, a hydrogen atom, a lead atom, a gold atom, etc. As late as the 1930s, scientists believed that the atom was the smallest, indivisible form of matter. But then they split the atom, and they found it to be constructed of a variety of components, generally called particles. Atomic particles have many forms and many names. Among the most enigmatic of all the discoveries in the field of particle physics is a phenomenon called spin. Inexplicably, these indivisible particles of an atom often have momentum of their own. They spin. The fact that particles spin, in my opinion, is one of the most fascinating and enigmatic facts in all the universe. What on earth, or what in heaven, what causes completely independent particles having no relationship with any other known force to spin? I think I know. God does. Is that too simple a deduction? First of all, if it wasn't for God's sovereign acts, the entire universe would be non-existent. Even if there were particles, which there could not be, they would be dormant, they would be inactive, and useless. But instead, God said, let there be light. Now consider this. The only other scientifically known primary force in nature apart from particles is a wave. A light consists of both waves and particles. A wave has no known physical substance. It might be an electromagnetic wave, which is some kind of light, or it might be a mechanical wave, which is some kind of sound. Either is essentially invisible, and for the most part, inexplicable. But the fact that Moses told us that God created light reveals what I believe to be the source of spin. Let me review this subject. God created every particle in nature. If he didn't, who did? If not, how did those particles come into existence from absolute void without some creative force at work? Every particle was at first inert, inactive, and dormant. But then God said, let there be light. And with the creation of those light waves, particles begin to spin. Once particles begin to spin, atoms began to be formed, and that made the elements. Atom joined to atom, and molecules were formed. Piece by piece, God assembled this entire universe. There was no Big Bang, but God created everything piece by piece. God fabricated the universe. Now, try to explain how God created waves from absolutely nothing if you can. I conclude that God Almighty rules every known law of science and physics, and God controls it all from behind a curtain. We do not know how he does it, and we will never know how he does it until we cross the great divide into his eternal presence, where the Bible says those things will be revealed to his elect, because the scripture says, then we shall know even as we are known. The ancient Romans popularized miniature dolls that were constructed with hinged joints and suspended by strings, puppets, 
and puppeteers date back to the very ancient history as far as 2,000 years before Christ in Egypt and Mesopotamia. Some of the ancient Greek and Roman plays, both comic and tragic, were performed by puppeteers hundreds of years before Jesus Christ was born. Then the Catholic Church began using these stringed puppets to teach their doctrines, principally the story of the Virgin Mary and the Roman Catholic doctrine of Mariology. That is how the puppeteers came to be known as marionettes. They were named after Mary. String pullers, they were called. At least one ancient manuscript called them conjurers. That implicated that the dancing puppets with their nearly invisible strings appeared to be magical in their performances. Indeed, if the strings could somehow be unobserved, one might actually believe that magic was at work. Now tell me what is so different from the very real world such as ours being choreographed and directed by a great divine string puller. Don't laugh. That is almost exactly what is happening. Whether or not you can see exactly how God makes things happen, you make no mistake about it, God is in control. From whence comes the electrical pulse that makes our hearts beat? From whence are the stars born? What causes electron particles to have a negative electrical charge and fly around neutrally charged neutrons and positively charged protons in each atom? Who defines the number of protons in an atom's nucleus so as to determine whether it will be a helium, hydrogen, aluminum, Krypton, or any other of the 118 known elements. And what unseen force causes galaxies and hurricanes and tornadoes to spin in a spiral twist? God. If not, whom? If not, how? All things were made by him, the Bible says, for his pleasure. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Revelation 4.11 Physicists define the universe primarily in four dimensions. Three spatial dimensions, height, width, and length. And a fourth dimension called time. But advanced theorists speak of up to 11 possible dimensions, maybe more. Some speak of parallel invisible universes that exist simultaneously within those that we readily observe. Yes, they're controversial. No, they have not all been proven. But this thing is sure. God certainly dwells in a parallel universe. Even though heaven is metaphorically referred to as above or on high, the Bible said John the Revelator was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and immediately he found himself in heaven. It did not take John 300 light years to get to heaven. He did not experience any known space travel. He was not transported millions or trillions of miles into the unknown. The Bible says he heard a voice from heaven calling him and, quote, Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one set on the throne. That's Revelation 4 and 2. Immediately John moved from the material world into the spiritual world. It was though John passed through a mysterious portal into another dimension. That is most certainly what happened. The Apostle Paul spoke of a similar experience in 2 Corinthians 12. He said, And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. So here stands a biblical example of a man entering into a parallel universe. Elisha's servant got a revelation of a parallel dimension when God opened his eyes to see heavenly horses and heavenly chariots on the hills of Israel. The Bible says, And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. 
And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about. Elisha, 2 Kings 6.17. Then the prophet Ezekiel saw into the parallel universe in Ezekiel chapter 10. In that chapter, Ezekiel saw the fantastical cherubs of God standing in the holy temple in Jerusalem, holding a slab of sapphire stone on their shoulders, upon which the very throne of God sat. Only one other prophet in the Bible saw anything similar to what Ezekiel saw. Isaiah said that in the year King Uzziah died, he saw the Lord in his temple in Jerusalem. Together, Isaiah and Ezekiel's sightings of the throne of God confirmed that for a period of several hundred years, perhaps beginning in the days of Solomon and the dedication of the beautiful temple in those days, God's throne actually sat on earth inside the holiest place of the temple. The Bible said Ezekiel saw the appearance of the likeness of a man sitting on the throne. The invisible Spirit of God became apparent to Ezekiel when he miraculously obtained the ability to see into that parallel universe of God's Spirit. Now, you and I need to know that God is not just the figment of our imagination. Please realize that faith in God is not faith in fantasy. The spiritual universe where God and his angels dwell is just as real as our material universe that we can see. And most amazing is the interface between the spirit world and the physical world. The spirit world is not created by our physical world, but the exact opposite is true. Whatever the spirit world is like, it is the origin of our material universe. God rules from the ethereal realm. Even though I may refer to God's realm as invisible, you can rest assured that all those who dwell in that realm are not invisible to each other. It is only invisible to us because we have no senses to perceive it. However, anyone who dwells in that dimension has perfectly attuned senses to all that dwells there. I wish I could articulate this as magnificently as I believe it in my heart. The Bible said, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I am also known, 1 Corinthians 13, 12. In that world we now speak of as invisible, we will see very clearly, just as God is now the discerner of the thoughts and intents of our hearts, everyone who enters his eternal kingdom will be discerners of the thoughts and intents of all others. Consider this from Genesis 1.27. The Bible said God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. So even though God is presently invisible to us, this reality is that this physical visible realm is modeled after another body. We see because God sees. We hear because God hears. We feel because God feels. His senses are the model for our senses. And notwithstanding, his wisdom is infinitely more magnificent than ours. You consider that the same God who presides over a material universe consisting of hundreds of billions, perhaps trillions of galaxies, each containing hundreds of billions of stars, is also presiding over a parallel universe in which hundreds of millions of angels stand watch over his throne alone. Moreover, this incomprehensible God also is so intimate with every tiny speck of his universe that he takes note even when a sparrow falls, and he knows exactly how many hairs are on each person's head. He even has a name, the Bible says, for every star in the universe, Psalms 147.4. You think this is completely outrageous and impossible? You better think again, because God is intertwined and interconnected with everything in every universe he has made. I'm old enough to remember when a computer file name was limited to eight characters for its base name. Every file name had to be eight letters or less, and then a dot separated the base name from a three-letter extension. And that was the maximum. 
but now in our new compu computer environment, we're able to use file names that are as long as 255 characters. Now, I suppose that God is able to use names that are a lot longer than 255 characters because you've got trillions of stars out you under. Don't you think that God is perfectly brilliant enough to conceive a unique name for trillions of individual stars, even if those names are as long as a freight train? I think so. Consider this. When scientists first began to discover the structure of an atom, they had no idea that its nucleus could be composed of even smaller components than electrons. But since the discovery of quarks, hadrons, leptons, prions, and who knows what else, we now know that atoms have many, even smaller components than we ever imagined. Yet, God is right there in the midst of them all, making them perform exactly as he created them to. While computer scientists are presently breeding organic processors for mainframe computers that they say will perform calculations in nanoseconds, that's one billionth of a second, it's worth taking note that God Almighty can and already has performed calculations far more impressively than any massive computer. How does that relate to this topic tonight? God is inconceivably potent at the microscopic, subatomic, quantum level. We cannot begin to imagine what his potential is. It's easy for us to imagine a God that's infinitely large but not so easy for our tiny brains to imagine a God that is infinitely small. I think that God's infinite smallness is the secret to his ability to micromanage every thought, intention, and outcome of every living thing on earth. God can do just as much in a nanosecond as we could do in a million years. There is no reason for us not to believe that the great eternal creator of us all is infinitely more capable than anything we've observed in nature. The biggest problem we have is that we just can't see into the darkness of God. And I'm talking about the treasures of darkness. That's why I'm so intent on persuading you to recognize that God's greatest glories exist in the dark. You can't see God's enormous glory with your natural eyes, nor can you hear his wonders with your natural ears, nor can you comprehend his measureless majesties with your natural mind. You have to have faith in God, that God is everything and more than you have ever imagined. Our God really is bigger than we ever thought he was. But more than that, he is infinitely smaller than we ever thought. He can rule either from the macroscopic or from the microscopic realms. While he presides over what may be an infinite number of universes, he also rules over every single cell, amoeba, molecule, atom, and particle. That's why supernatural things occasionally occur to us human beings. God Almighty has programmed his creatures with certain components of his eternal realm and nature. Occasionally, we're allowed to have paranormal experiences which, if properly managed, will validate and enhance our relationship with him. Many years ago, Gene Roddenberry, who was the creator of the famous Star Trek television series, depicted a fascinating futuristic device on board an intergalactic spacecraft. It was called a transporter. This fictional invention was capable of beaming up a person from one location to another location invisibly. The scientific theory was that its massive computing power could scan every atom of a human body down to the quantum level and could simultaneously deconstruct it from one location, beam it to another location, and reconstruct it there. Supposedly, according to their theory, a person could disappear from their spaceship and immediately reappear on any designated location. The operator of that device was named Scotty, and he became a household name when the fans of that series oft repeated that phrase, Beam me up, Scotty. They had a similar gadget on board that fictional spacecraft that was called the Replicator. 
The replicator could create any requested item by reconstructing it molecule by molecule. This sophisticated device was programmed to create anything you requested instantly. If you wanted a hot meal, you could press a few buttons and the meal would materialize right before your eyes. The premise that something can be deconstructed or constructed or reconstructed molecule by molecule on demand is really not far-fetched. We would have insisted before now that such devices were mere fantasy, but do you know that science is actually moving rapidly in that very direction? Already, 3D printers are creating parts for automobiles, and unbelievably, they are now creating human body parts. The fact is that the entire universe was put together molecule by molecule. Some people may struggle with the notion that God Almighty scooped into the dust of the earth and formed Adam essentially as a dirt or a clay model and then that he breathed into the nostrils of that model, that statue, and a man became a living soul. But to reject that proposition is to demand that it all came from mindless, random accidents. That was not essentially different than believing that a, a Corvette can accidentally materialize on your driveway if you just stand there and wait for a few billion years, which of course is ludicrous. Don't dismiss the biblical proposal as fictional or too fantastic. Don't say it's impossible. Remember that the alternative to believing the Bible story of creation is to require that the entire human race to have evolved from absolutely nothing without any conscience controls. Before you get too strung out on how a human might have evolved from a tadpole You'd better figure out how the entire cosmos appeared out of absolutely nothing. And that's a problem no scientist on earth has ever yet had a clue to. Where did the first particle come from? Where did the first galaxy or the first anything? Then you'll realize that there's only one reasonable conclusion. There really is an intelligent, invisible spirit presiding over all things material from behind the curtain of light. From the unseen darkness, an invisible but infinite God constructs and deconstructs at will. And don't you kid yourself, if that spirit is brilliant enough to spawn this vast, seemingly infinite universe, he is perfectly capable of personalizing himself and making himself known to you and me. And it really isn't far-fetched at all to believe that God would then materialize himself in the form of a man named Jesus and endear himself sacrificially to his most prized creatures, and that's mankind. Back to this replicator transporter analogy. Do you know that Jesus replicated wine in water jugs? You remember that? That meant that molecules were altered. Jesus replicated eyeballs in empty sockets. That m required the creation of matter. Atoms and molecules had to be assembled and reassembled in that man's eyes. Jesus replicated healthy tissues and limbs on a leper's diseased body, and instantly it was well. That required molecular reconstruction. Jesus surrendered to his murderers, but after three days and nights in a tomb as a dead corpse, he reanimated himself without blood. How many miracles did it take for Jesus to put life back into muscles and nerves and eyes and ears? He was no longer made out of mortal flesh and blood as you and I. He was transformed into immortal substance, not a blood-based organism as we are, but a spirit-based organism that lives forever. And then just days later, he transported himself from the physical dimension into the invisible dimension. And then shortly thereafter, from the invisible dimension, he spoke to Saul of Tarsus from the ether. Without making a physical appearance, he mysteriously transported Philip instantaneously from the Gaza Strip to a town near Caesarea at least 40 miles away. That's transporting and the miracles continue to this day. The important thing to realize here is that what we call miracles, 
what are inexplicable events to us are not inexplicable to God. God fully knows the mechanics of miracles. They're not miracles to God. They are all in a day's work. They are totally comprehensible, totally normal activities for this omniscient, all-knowing, omnipotent, all-powerful, omnipresent God. The premise here is that it is perfectly reasonable to believe that an infinitely able God is far more than capable of designing and creating an entire universe, molecule by molecule, then staffing it with fantastic living creatures of countless species. In discussing these topics, we have not departed from the larger theme of treasures of darkness, all the mysterious powers I have referred to here are hidden treasures and cannot be seen or experienced by skeptics and unbelievers. I'm talking to you. Those who adamantly insist on believing only what they can see with their eyes and hear with their ears will never be able to discover the greater truths of what really is going on behind the dark curtain within God's invisible universes. They've been blinded by the light of temporary things. The Bible says, And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went up before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was a cloud and darkness to them but it gave light by night to these, so that the one came not near the other all the night. That's Exodus 14, 19. I'm here to tell you that in that story, God Almighty made one cloud darkness to Egypt and light to Israel. And there are so many things that happened. It, it, the same principle happened in the story of the Passover when the blood was put over their doors, the the spirit of death that killed off the firstborn of all Egypt did not kill off the children. God is capable of making every situation, one situation can be dark on one hand and light simultaneously. And I'm here to tell you that in your situation, those situations in your personal life that seem to be so dark right now, you may be going through sickness, you may be going through depression, you may be going through demon possession, you may be going through every kind of a trial that is imaginable man, and life itself seems like it is pitch black and pitch darkness but I'm here to tell you there is a star in the darkest night and it is the star of Jacob it is the light of Jesus Christ and there is a treasure in your darkness if you'll trust in God what you cannot see with your naked eye you've got to turn on your heart and your mind and your faith and believe there's a God in heaven that is there in that darkness that is creating and doing miracles that defy all of our imaginations God cares about you in the darkest hours of your life, and whether you can see him or not, he's there to help you through your great adversity and your great dark trial. I pray for you tonight that God will show himself to you and make himself real to you. I thank you for staying with me tonight. Thank you for being with me in this program. I appreciate you taking the time to view all these programs. And I hope you'll come again every Monday night and every Thursday night at 9 p.m. Meanwhile, join me on all my social networks, Facebook and Twitter, Google+, LinkedIn, Instagram, Pinterest, and especially sign up for my uh, YouTube channel. Please click the subscribe button, and as soon as you click the subscribe button, there's a little blue bell there. Click on that blue bell, and that means you will get notifications of future videos as we post them one by one. And then last of all, please Go to Amazon.com and check out all my books. There, there's nine uh, apostolic Pentecostal books there that I've written. I'd like for you to have every one of them. Check it out and see which ones you're most interested in. And uh, I know they'll be a blessing to you. Thank you for being with me again. I'll see you next time. God bless you. Good night.